lots of decisions riding on a bunch of tests, including chest x-ray. And the problem with chest x-ray is it's an image. So it's not a number that you can chart. It's um, if you acquired a whole bunch of these images from previous visits, for example, it's very hard for the physician in the context of emergency room to call up the previous 20 x-rays and start looking at them and figuring out how the patient progressed, for example, in their previous visit. So our goal in this project is convert the image into a number so that it can be treated just like any other quantitative biomarker of heart failure and integrated into decision systems. There is another kind of application for if we succeed with this, which is that to evaluate a new way to treat patients, oftentimes the clinical trials are set up in such a way that you do the treatment and then measure things about the patient. And so if we can convert chest x-ray, which is the immediate sort of manifestation of heart failure into a number, then suddenly clinical trials become much easier and you can bring the interventions much faster to practice. So that's kind of the setup for the problem. And so, okay, edema comes in four different levels, just like almost everything in medicine I've encountered so far that is actually continuous uh, variable, but we are asking physicians to give us a particular answer. And so we'll have none mild, moderate, and severe, and they have come with medical terms of vascular, interstitial, and alveolo. Um, and our goal is given an image to produce one of these numbers. And in reality, we'll probably be producing a continuous number that then gets discretized into these levels, and we want to be as accurate as physicians. So there are a couple of challenges with even that setup. So those of you who work on machine learning can say, oh, well, I know how to solve this problem. You give me tons of images with lots of labels, and I train a classifier to produce the number. So there are a bunch of problems. One of them is that there are no labels. Instead, information about how severe the patient is is captured in a radiology report that Seth or one of his colleagues wrote. And sometimes it happens before the patient was treated, sometimes it happens simultaneously, but basically these radiology reports describe what the radiologist saw. And oftentimes they see more than just what we care about. So some parts of the radiology report will be about something that has nothing to do with edema. And some of the text, when you read it, you know that the person wasn't sure. And so, of course, our automatic sort of keyword searching scripts then say, I don't know, roughly. So we have a lot of images, but the labels come in this funny shape. So let's give you a sense, let me give you a sense of what the data looks like before I tell you what the solution is. We have quarter million chest x-rays that BIDMC in their wisdom released for general research. So for those of you who are interested in doing research in medical image analysis, there's this amazing data set that's accessible through PhysioNet or Mimic. Either of these keywords will take you to the right place. You fill out an online form and you get quarter million images. So out of those images, if we we'll narrow it down to heart failure cohort, it goes down by an order of magnitude. And then it goes down again. If we look just at the images, we're looking for keyword, keywords that the physicians defined to be associated with a particular level of edema, we could label with some level of confidence that this was really the right level of edema. And so very quickly in the project, it became obvious that we're not going to get anywhere here because we have no good way to measure what we've done. And so then Seth and three other fearless radiologists bit the bullet and did consensus labeling of about 150 images. And so this one, every radiologist labeled the images. And then every image in which there was disagreement, they had a discussion and tried to come to a consensus. And so we have now a data set where there is really like very solid consensus labeling. So all of the testing that I will show you is on these labels, not the noisy labels that we extracted with keyword match. So we're training on noisy labels, but we will evaluate on as close to sort of ground truth as we can get here. Okay. And so, oh, sorry, before I tell you what we've done, so let me tell you that training your favorite ResNet or DenseNet or whatever on those labels doesn't get you close enough. The performance is about 70%, 75%, and it's just not good enough. 
like in the, when we look at mistakes that it's making, they're kind of embarrassing. Any sort of resident would know that that's not the right answer. So I'm not even going to show you those results. Please Let me show you. So Go ahead. What is the uh, human, like uh, whatever, the expert accuracy they compare against? Ah, uh, great question. So if you look at, con so if you look at that consensus labeling and then compare the radiology reports that we have in the system, if the agreement, it's somewhere between 0.4 and 0.6, 0.7, and we are on the upper end of it. So we are like a very good radiologist at this point. I'm kind of afraid to say anything like that and have just like, you know, that's when you get smitten. <laughs> Okay, and yeah, so the variability is quite high and disagreement is quite high among, among the physicians. And I think there are two reasons for it. One of them is true variability where people read it differently. The other one is an artifact of us forcing them to say, is it two or is it three? Or is it one or is it two? And oftentimes they will say, well, it's like 2.7. And the other person says, well, no, it's more like 2.4 is in their mind. And so as a result, one of them says two and the other one says three. So some variability, we make it as opposed to it's inherent on in how radiologists read the scans. Yes? Uh, in that agreement, so does that take into account potential mistakes by regex? Is there something where in the initial consensus, we have agreements between this initial view per person to the consensus, we don't have the possibility of regex causing a lower kappa? So when we pick the images, we just pick the images and give them to the radiologist yeah. without them knowing yeah. about regex. Yeah. I'm saying that when you say the agreements with the historical labels, yeah. something, yeah. Does that, is that counting the possible errors of the doing text search on historical labels? Like, no, 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 it's, it's uh, ah, yes, I understand now what it's you're saying. Point. Okay, so, so we've very carefully looked at every radiology report okay. that we read. Like at this point, Ray Lau, who is one of the two graduate students who worked on this, basically knows every image in this database, I feel like. Right. right. So we've looked carefully at that. And it really, it's also confirmed by literature. Basically, people have done this task of having radiologists rate the images, and they always come up with somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7 agreement. And so then they say, well, you know, there's lots of a disagreement. But the question is, what do you do about it practically? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me tell you what we're doing now to fix that model. So again, our model is, it's a classifier and is there a pointer? No. Aha. Uh -huh. It's okay, it's okay. Let's look, I'm not ashamed of giving talks in person. <laughs> like I could use a mouse, but it's sort of ridiculous. Anyway, so the top, the top stream is your standard image classification. X is the input image. Z is this latent representation that we are going to learn. And Y is the label. And so Y hat is the predicted label and Y in the middle there is the true label. And so most of you, oh, perfect, thank you. And so most of you can write a bunch of loss functions, cross entropy being the one we are using because we are naive about these things. Um, between, the difference between y and y hat is what you want to penalize. So here's what we are going to do. We're going to build another stream of processing during training. And it's text through encoder. So R means a report here. And predicted label on the reports. And again, something like cross entropy to make those two agree. Okay, and so why are we doing this? For two reasons. One of them is this text came with this image, so it describes the image. So there's something to be had by learning space in which these two are related. And second, text, it turns out, is easier to classify than images. So if I just take the bottom stream and I train a model like that, a classifier from a text using fairly vanilla NLP models, I get much higher accuracy of classification than I get of the images. So second point is that the text will drag the image into the right representation, where the latent space will represent something that is relevant to our decision. And that's what we're doing. For those of you who do contrastive learning, it's exactly contrastive learning. So the idea here is that we will take the latent representations from images and latent representations from report, and we will force the matching pairs 
to embed close to each other and mismatch pairs to embed far away. And we've done a bunch of work thinking about kind of like how these pairs, mismatch pairs should be generated. You want to generate them to be hard to classify from the same patient or the same level of severity. It's all the usual tricks of contrastive learning. Okay, and so we have three cost functions. Two cost functions that just force the classifiers to work well. And the third term, which right now we're in this part of the talk, we're using contrastive learning. So think of distances or dot products between vectors that force Zs to be close to each other when the two pair, then the pair is matched and far away from each other when it's mismatched. And I've written out here abstractly enough in similarity because Ray and Gidika, Gidika is another PhD student who worked on this project. He, she's from Pete Solovitz's group. And so he's involved in the project as well. So Gidika worked on the sort of language part because when we started, we knew nothing about language or NLP. And so we found a friend who did and uh, these two students worked together. Okay, and so we train it. Yes. So the why that you have the label, this is from the regex. Right? Mm -hmm. The text classifier is trying to learn the regular stuff. Right? Yes, okay. it's kind of silly in some sense. But what we got to see is that actually it does reasonably well then on image on the reports that we can't label. Right. So we train it and then we strip all of the stuff away and we are left with. And we're left with just the image model. So when we deploy the model, it's just the image model. We don't need Seth to read the image before we can classify it, which would defeat the purpose. The goal is to have that number instantaneously when the image is acquired. So let me show you the results. Um, it takes a little bit of explanation to interpret the results. So remember how we have four levels. We're going to tell the difference between zero Zero and one, two, three. Zero, one, and two, and Uh -huh, I'm seeing red there. Okay, great. And so image only is AUC if we just do the supervised model that I described. And basically, you know, Seth and Steve look at this and go, hmm, you got to work on it some more. So then joint supervised is the model where I use exactly the same data set in terms of images. It's the images that could be labeled and I bring in the radiology report. So it's the same six on the order of 6,000 images but now it's image and radiology report pairs. And you get quite a bit of a boost. And then the semi supervised is I realized that all those pairs of image and radiology report for which I don't have labels, I can also pump through the training engine using just the embedding cost. Let me go back. So for image, for image text pairs, for which I don't have the label, I can optimize just this term and ignore these two. So it helps shape the latent space, but it doesn't help with classification in some sense because we don't know what the labels are. And so you get a boost, additional boost by doing semi-supervised learning that way. Yes. I wonder what is the dimensionality of the latent space? I assume it is common between the Amazon encoder and the text. So by the time they get to the latent space, they're the same dimensionality, right? Because our goal is to make them the same. It's actually, I was sort of nearsighted and I tried to push Ray and Girica very hard to make the representation identical, to have just one classifier that goes off the latent representation. And it invariably in every task performs worse. 
So it turns out that letting them still live kind of in their own subspaces, like being soft about it helps. But these uh, representations are in tens of numbers or maybe hundreds of numbers, but not more than that. You know, so like think of powers up to like 64 or 128 or something like that. Okay, so great. And so I could end now, or I can tell you kind of the next piece. And the next piece came from realization that there is something a little bit missing in this, which is, as I mentioned before, the image has lots of stuff in addition to the pulmonary edema that we care about. And the radiology report has lots of stuff that has nothing to do with our task. So if we we'll get to shape the latent space in such a way that it's centered around this question of edema, so that it looks at local descriptors of features in the image and radiology report sentences, we might do better. And so I would love to do this talk in a continuous way as if it's one story, but you know, research doesn't happen that way. So at this point in time, both Ray and Gitika got interested with statistical contrastive learning, statistical loss functions with contrastive learning. So here you will see a switch, bait and switch kind of thing from distance based contrastive learning to maximizing mutual information between the representations contrastive learning. We've discovered empirically that it makes no, close to no difference. So it's very exciting theoretically, but empirically we found that both measures do about as well. And so I have to ask your forgiveness, but basically from now on, we are going to maximize mutual information and minimize negative mutual information between the two representations. But if you are more comfortable thinking about distances, just continue thinking about learning to make things close if they match and far away if they don't. OK, so here's where what we would like to do. The radiology reports in, the report includes a bunch of sentences. And each sentence describes something in the image. And quite often, that something in the image is a region in the image. So the colors here match. A green sentence about a mass and a green window in the image match in that the, they correspond to the same object. Then the yellow, the left lung appears clear, is this box on the right, because radiological convention is such that the patient is facing you. Um, plural the sentence about plural effusions kind of corresponds to where you would have to look to establish that there are no plural effusions. So this is the kind of thinking we want to have. This is the kind of representation we would like to have. And so I'll show you the first step towards that. And in particular, so this is our model. But now, instead of this joint embedding loss being representation of an image being matched to representation of text, we will have representation of local regions of the image and local features in the report, which is one sentence. We'll use kind of sentence as a report. And so effectively what it's doing is, it, it's so right now it's the first step towards the solution. So it chunks up the image into fixed regions for now. And so each image comes with a representation. Here's the representation of the sentence. So these are the two encoders that converted whatever objects we had into um, vectors of the same length. Then we're going to find out of all these regions, the region in the image that matches the, the, uh, the sentence in the report the best. And so in this work, our measure is mutual information. I have a feeling that you could do it with distance-based contrastive learning and it would work as well. And so once we find the most matching one, we maximize that. So it's not the average matching cost. It's really the maximal matching cost. And the hypothesis here is that you optimize this until the region and the sentence actually match each other. Like that's where you get the maximization, where you get the good solution. And so it iterates this in the regular training sense. Yes. I understand that if you think correctly, you are setting the region to be a fixed area. Yes. Yes. And we have some ideas on how to make them flexible, and we should make them flexible. And I'm hunting for a student yeah, to make them flexible. Uh, like complex, you know, you can yes. You know, yeah. Like so, so effectively, what we would have to do is replace this fixed representation with things like RedNN or CNN or something like that that allows the, or mask our CNN, I guess, 
to to enable us to really outline the objects. Yes, it's exactly you're exactly pointing out the next project. Okay, and so I don't want to, you to read all the tables. What I want to highlight is that uh -huh, we have two estimators of mutual information. You can ignore it for now. We basically concluded that they're equally good. Um, the blue row here highlights the previous result. This is the global descriptor that I showed you before. And so the performance was somehow in the low 80s um, for the first two boundaries in the low 90s in the third in the, in the third boundary. And so local descriptors just boost everything up. So our one conclusion is that even with this very impoverished sense of what it means to be local, these fixed regions that we plopped onto the images, we already get improvement in performance by learning local relationships rather than learning representation of the whole image. And for those of you who are sort of at this point sick of pulmonary edema, we also tested it on pretty much every finding the check script, which is the tool out of Stanford gives us from radiology reports. So we've tried it on many different radiological findings and the conclusion is always the same. Learning local descriptors is much better than learning local descriptors. It's a very stable kind of finding. And I think the additional point here is that then it can fit the task much better than learning this general descriptor that captures everything. Okay, so what would we like to do as part of our engagement with Jake Clinic? And this is basically our future work and ideas. Yes. No, it's super naive. Every patch for its own. You would have to know much more about doing NLP to do something like that than we do. No, no, I think you only need on the image side, but I'll talk about that later. But you need to understand what it means to say elsewhere, right? Learning algorithms. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I think both NLP model and the image model here can be dramatically improved. This is just sort of like the first attempt to capture the difference, uh, to capture this relationship. Um, I should also give credit where it's due. The whole idea came about because Steve, because Jim Glass was talking about his work with Antonio Toralpa on learning from people speaking about uh, pictures. And we went, oh, we have example of people writing about pictures. And so a lot of ideas are borrowed from that work and we kind of have to adapt it to our context, yes. I meant to compliment the previous comment that uh, you can use positional information for the algorithm, yes. right? So maybe you're using already to inform the, the algorithm where exactly it will position and the aim of that is so I think it depends. I think it depends on the kind of images you work with. So, for example, in the brain, I can normalize the brains very well to a common coordinate system, right? Then so as a result, then positional information becomes super important because it actually is highly correlated with functional information. Registering these images to each other into a common coordinate system is a much more challenging task because many of these patients wear devices. Some of them, so this is 2D image of a 3D object. So there is that loss of information. So it's one of these things where Yes, that would be fantastic, but I worry that in general, sort of, you can't say that this is true about general anatomical images. That it might be more challenging for some than others. Okay, and so this is our fantasy, which we haven't gotten yet to, right? Where the model learns, model learns the matches where the windows are flexible. And as part of doing basically grad cam on the resulting classifier, I get this match as well as the pair that is most important for the decision. And also I should say, I would love to talk to people who think about how to create that supportive evidence for decisions because we have another project working on that in this data set. And the other thing that I should say is again, Ray and Steve and Seth are doing, which to me seems kind of a little bit scary is that uh, the idea is to put this in the hospital and see how physicians react to it. And so this is kind of what we envision, right? There is some sort of visualization 
of the pulmonary edema, as well as many other things. And the physicians can plug in possible interventions and predict kind of how it's going to go. But this is, I suspect, some years off for it to actually work. OK, let me summarize. But before I do, I should say that this is collaboration with many, many people. And it was generously funded by several organizations at MIT and outside. Um, to conclude, what I showed you is our work in using neural networks to shape in multimodal scenarios to shape the latent space in such a way that the classification accuracy of modality specific model improves. Um, so rather than creating these unsupervised kind of representations of how images relate to text, our goal is to classify images and we're using text to improve the representation and then classification accuracy. Um, we learned that because some modalities are better than others of doing this classification, effectively everybody benefits and that the latent representation improves. And finally, our sort of um, plans for the future include really pushing this towards building it into a clinical support system. Thank you. Well, now, thank you very much, Polina. And now we are going to move to the interactive part of our uh, I'm not sure how to do it with the. Uh, yeah, maybe you can bring it if possible. Yeah. And uh, uh, while uh, I'm not trying to help us to organize it, uh, uh, you can get to thinking about the question. But the thing that we are going to do is uh, to ask um, uh, Seth to do what Polina promised he's going to do. <laughs> Correct? To see is it really clinically important and is it translatable before we all can decide? And tell them you want to work, I guess. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. This is a really a, a huge problem in, in medicine. We simplify it off and we say, oh, are they wet or are they dry? And, and because there's a, a lot of things that, that happen in the patient, they're quite complex. And understanding of whether or not the patient's symptoms are due to fluid in the lungs, that being wet um, or not, is, is a constant challenge. And the, the chest radiograph is, is, is a valuable piece of data, but there is so much, so much challenge in us, in us evaluating, you know, as you saw from the inter, uh, interrater variability and even trained radiology that we get to this. Um, and so having having a tool that could be more quantitative um, is, is somewhat of a holy grail. Um, and you know, trying to really understand that the patient's individual fluid balance could really you know, change not only the management of heart failure, but the management of sepsis uh, and the, the many critically ill patients. Oh, okay. So, uh, so can I ask, sorry, um, like among many possible applications of technologies, you know, this gravity thing can be applied for the whole world. Like, it seems to me that humans can do it reasonably okay, maybe not perfect, but they can do it. Uh, uh, what is the main motivation for automating it? Like among the different things that you do in workflow, is it something it then certainly uh, that you don't know, that you don't agree? Is it something that should be very fast when you are seeing the patient? And uh, I'm asking again, so it seems that like Polina now achieved that the team is good enough to check comparable to human performance, so where the events are maintaining. So, so great, great questions. questions. So, so I think you know, oftentimes when we see machine learning applied to medicine, it's tackling the easy problems. Um, you know, things like looking for large pneumothoraces, large punctures in the lung. And you know, in those cases, those are aren't necessarily things that physicians have trouble with. Um, but you can take those algorithms and deploy them in different settings. So if you you know, for example, there are, are commercial applications where they actually the X-ray machine itself can detect these dangerous conditions, and even before a human even looks at the image, it can warn you. So that's one way of deploying technology. I think for this project, um, 
it's the the way that it would be really valuable to think is mentioned is when you're thinking about fluid status, it's all about trajectory. It's understanding that um, the trend that the patient's condition has had. Because these are elderly patients. These are many of these patients are patients who've had you know, potentially tens or hundreds of images. Um, and it's impossible for humans to go back in time and understand that trajectory. But if you have an algorithm that can quickly go through it and still each image down to a numerical score, then you can suddenly not only start to, to graph trajectories like you've shown a, a schematic here, um, but you can start to correlate those trends with things like how they were treated and um, develop phenotypes, not only for the condition, but also phenotypes for response. So for example, if this patient is given 20 milligrams of intravenous Lasix, that, how does that change their quantitative pulmonary score? And that's how we can envision kind of dramatically changing the management of heart failure but once we have a better quantity of tool or, or assessment. So, so I don't know if I asked all of your questions. Uh, so, so do, do you have a particular timeline in mind of actually bringing in the clinic or you can do some technical pieces to still make the clinic? So um, I think one of the barriers uh, and, and Paulina alluded to this as well is you know, getting physicians to trust something is, is difficult. Um, and especially where, when, um, you know, when the network fails, it doesn't necessarily fail in the same way that a human would. Um, in the sense that oftentimes, you know, a junior resident will look at an image and they'll, they'll say, oh, I think this is severe pulmonary edema. A more senior clinician will say, oh, actually it's all on one side. This looks more like a pneumonia or infection. You know, both can have an overlap. Um, oftentimes there's some rationale why that human made that determination. Um, where, but sometimes that they, you know, first of all, the network can't explain itself. Um, and so these are things we're trying to do now to try to, to say, okay, even if the depth, even if the output doesn't make sense, if there's a, a logical way of explaining um, why that that decision was made, um, that will help. Because what, the last thing we want is to deploy a system that, you know, no system would be perfect because as we say, you know, humans are imperfect in this task. Um, but we want to deploy a system that at least is understandable and um, clinicians understand if it's not going to perform optimally, what, how, how it does. So if I may add to that, my experience is that effectively all, quite a lot of times these solutions don't get their integrated clinically directed. What happens is that they use to discover something about either the disease or the treatments the way we do it now, and to change how we treat, as opposed to sort of you know put it in and it replaces somebody who is doing it now. Right. It's, it's more it's tough. Right. Or but again, like I think most of the promise is in getting the physicians to discover something about the current state of the statement of treat, state of treatment that can be changed and improved at the doctor. Thank you. Getting back to this after one of my trust. When clinicians uh, around pulmonary edema or potential pulmonary edema, do they use the brain? Other than the image itself, and if so, can you speak a bit about what might need to be known for the image in order to properly contextualize it with that additional information? Great question. And I would broaden it even further in the sense that the clinicians, you know, the clinicians at the bedside were ultimately making the decision, um, won't even necessarily agree with the expert opinion of the radiologist. And you know, that's what makes these decisions so challenging because um, you know, both physicians have biases. Um, you have a radiologist who's, who's you know, more trained in observing the image, uh, but they actually don't know the condition of the patient. Um, so you might say on one hand, that's a more accurate assessment because they're not biased by the condition. But at, this, at the same time, you have a bedside clinician who knows the patient is getting clinically worse 
Um, so they bring that that bias to solve it to reading the image, um, but that bias actually could lead them to a more accurate assessment because they have that additional information. So, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of this information isn't quantifiable. So, um, you know, there are biomarkers or something called BNP, which is a measure of how stressed the vegetables are. Um, we've tried to use that to improve the accuracy. Um, unfortunately, that's a that's a value that that doesn't change as quickly um, as pulmonary pulmonary edema can change in minutes or, or hours. Where BNP changes over the course of usually days, um, and it's not something that you measure with high frequency. Um, and you know, a lot of the things that the bedside physician will use when ultimately assessing um, are are things like you know their subjective shortness of breath or how clear the lungs sound when they, they listen with a stethoscope uh, or for the control. And these are these are all very different variables to to codify and put into a you know an album. I don't know David is that that answer your question or just going to answer it. Does that additional creation to say shortness of breath uh, or did the lung sound clear would knowing that change the way that you would interpret the same thing with or without that information? So I'm trying to figure out are they independent to your source of, of information about some underlying like phenomena, or does that actually change the way you interpret that to a pixel or would 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 seeing some phenomena image have a different diagnosis, for example, yeah. because of that additional symptom information. Yeah, no, I, I think it is that latter. It, it does change the way you, you interpret the pixels um, because of you know that that anchoring that happens. Um, then it all depends on, on how, how strong your, your thinking is. Uh, but uh, it, it certainly does change. The other thing that is really important and critical when looking at images is looking at pairs of images and changes. So, um, you know, I think all the work we've presented so far is looking at single images and features. Um, but you know, to to David's point, you know, the, the pixels in one image could have very different meaning if they've been stable over years. Um, and that's something that clinical radiologists do often is that we look at, let's say, interstitial opacities, which is one of our classic keywords for that level two edema. But if it's stable over time, that more likely to do the fibrosis. Um, and uh, you know, what we're doing, what some of the work we're doing now is looking at pairs of images and assessing comparisons. And we know at least, or one of our hypotheses is that assessing, because we know humans are better at change than individual scoring, perhaps that would be better um, change. Yeah, so uh, if I understand correctly, like well, one of the big values really is that it's using it as a discovery tool to look at long term trends. So even if the tool is you know, noisy, is it forever be some level of noisy today? Uh, do you think it would, like, how would you perceive plugging it in just to offer the retrospective across all the prior XAs you would be expected to score it? How would you, if you implement it as such, how would you judge clinical success? Like, if you were to run a trial and say some number of radiologists have access to this whole how would you judge if the model was correct? The clinical workflow now is not about this particular image. Do you, you see what I mean? Like, the, the, we're trying to judge, like, in this, when we view the discovery tool, what is the bar for us to, to implement it? And how do we judge the success of the implementation? Then? Good question. Um, you know, I think as far as, you know, clinical application, I can see that as being very valuable in the sense that um, it, it can guide the physician on which historical prior images are relevant for different types. And so if, if um, you know, I think this patient, you know, perhaps has interstitial edema, which is our level two, I'm not sure if it's, um, you know, if this is their baseline or not, I might look for historicals that are either two or three uh, based on this tool. Um, when judging success, I think you still need to kind of look at the individual uh, images in the sense of, okay, the, the tool told me to look at, at this image because it thought they were in alveolar edema, but actually that, that's normal. Um, so I think you, you still need to be um, 
you know, accurate to some sense. Yeah. Um, you know, the, again, getting back to kind of, you know, like a failure mode that affects kind of analysis, if it's, if it's off by small amounts, and you can say, well, I, I understand how it could have thought that, and that not as big of a concern or the sense of, okay, this was the, you know, this was not, red is now the older edema, but there's some other process in the lung that's causing it to opacify. Again, these are understandable failure modes. Um, but to push a little further, like what, how would you quantify the value of C, like would it be make it come to the decision faster? Was it like, a smaller relapse if it's not coming back a number of time. Even if we just stress the time access, even the program is perfect. How do we quantify the the, the value you achieve to see information? Design something like a trial around that. Great, great question. Um, and this is this is one of the other big challenges in how do we translate uh, really cool, innovative tools from from all of you guys or you know, anyone in, into the healthcare environment. Especially where it involves, you know, potentially some cost, right? right. And, and at the same time, you know, someone's going to have to pay for it. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately, that comes down to value. So, one of the reasons we're focusing on heart failure is it's one of the large, I mean, it's one of the, the largest cardiovascular diseases. I think the number, one, the number one killer in the United States. Heart failure affects a tremendous number. Um, and heart failure, especially patients coming back to the hospital after being diagnosed and treated for heart failure, is a major, major problem. So kind of the, the holy grail here is to be able to accurately or to, to treat people effectively and prevent them from coming back to the hospital. Um, that being said, we're, we'd be very naive to think that simply a, you know, an algorithm that can better assess pulmonary edema can lead to reduced readmissions and ultimately drive down the cost of healthcare. Um, so it's it's very complicated and, and and reducing readmissions, which is like I said, a huge target in heart failure management, requires you know a lot of human resources, people calling patients at home, making sure patients take their medicine, making sure they don't take, you know, eat a lot of Campbell's soup or a lot of high sodium diet at home. Um, but at least low well, so sodium there, even that is still very high in sodium. Um, but we, we do think, you know, at least on our vision, is that more quantitative assessments, though, can, are, are a key part of it. If I can add to that, so what we're doing as a next step of this project is actually not predicting, not classifying pulmonary edema, but looking at um, risk of readmission. So it turns out that based on our score, estimated scores, we can stratify patients and the risk of readmission varies dramatically based on the level of edema. And of course, that's not really good enough because it's sort of indirect, right? I'm going to predict edema and then predict. Our goal now is to be able to predict the risk of readmission, which is clinically actionable information. If you think that the risk of readmission to this particular patient is higher than their level of edema, for example, suggests on average, you might want to think carefully about releasing them from the hospital right now versus waiting another day versus somebody who actually looks good for their level of overall health. We have a question. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to some comments about uh, depression health diagnosis is by tools. So in those results actually show something really interesting. There is kind of resemblance between the text is the physiology people and then also a cash from the physiology image. So the people in the fish learning algorithm not only produce a diagnosis but also produce some type of so um, certainly certainly correlation with with imaging findings I think it's very uh, you know this is a particularly hard problem to do that um, because the, the findings aren't always clearly delineated by clear boundaries so in, you know, more, you know, if, if we wanted a simpler problem, we would have 
because we were worried that it was potentially looking at the amount of so the, the size of the heart would correlate with pulmonary edema, but it's a very, very different kind. And so the fact that it wasn't picking up on that huge heart size actually reassured me that I knew this was doing something. Um, that being said, a lot of times that is highly, highly important. And um, that, that I think gets us to a point right, where the the algorithm is similar to again a junior number. I think that's that's our best hope is that it's, it's it's similar to the junior that we'll make an assessment, but at least it then is assessment. The reason I made the score is because of this feature. Um, I'm not sure how how, how useful synthesized text is. Um, you know, in this particular use case, and I think there are probably use cases that uh, you know, at the end of the day, there are you know, there will be kind of discrete categories of, of people who correspond to different subjects. In some ways, I think these are there was an question about that. Yeah. 
No, it's not about doing that because basically they're working. So this data set, you have to realize that this data set is last 10 years of chest x ray and VIP emergency. So it's everyone who went through the door and got the chest x ray. So if that is in Unrepresentative, then I know I don't know what will be satisfactory, right? So, in some sense, the pleasure of working with this large data helping answer data set is that you know that anybody who goes to the NDMC is captured there, right? So, it's as representative as that part of it. In some applications, I would, and in some applications, I would not. Right. So, for example, anatomical differences. So, you know, very simply, people are heavier somewhere versus other places. I think the model would go kind of awry, and you would have to do something at the point of presenting the images to the model to compensate. So, I wouldn't expect to translate across every dimensionality. Having said that, the medical region, I have seen all kinds of examples where it just works out of the box across different medical centers. It's much less variable than some other lab results or EHR data. 